chapter 5 of John's Gospel continued now. Let's begin with the prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of Almighty God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. John, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right, so we we're talking about how the Son can do nothing of his own accord. How do we properly understand that enigmatic statement of our Lord? Uh, we got to spend a little time on this. Whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. Um, so here's what Aquinas argues. He says that this can't possibly refer to his human nature when he says this. How can it refer to his human nature? Because it's, it's kind of like uh, a collective. Everything. Um, the Father, the, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, that the Son does likewise. Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Well, that includes an awful lot, folks. That includes the creation of the cosmos. All right. The Father created the cosmos. All right. Long before our Lord's human nature was involved, came on the scene. Okay. Before he assumed a human nature, God, the Father, created the cosmos. That was one of the works of the Father. So in saying for what, for whatever he does, whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise, that there's this synergy, the two of them working in concert with one another, always and at all times, from all eternity. This can only be a reference to his divine nature, not his human nature, which hadn't come into existence yet. Okay, that's Aquinas' point here that now our Lord is directly arguing for his divine nature from the standpoint of his divine nature because that's what they're challenging. They see, and rightly so, that in stating that my father is working still and I am working, uh, they hear these things that he's saying. They hear him make that claim. And they see this as blasphemy because he is called God his father and therefore is making himself equal with God. So that's what's at stake in chapter five is his divinity, his divine nature. So our Lord is arguing now from that standpoint. So set aside his human nature for a second here and we're going to concentrate in the rest of this chapter here in this chapter on his divine nature nature his divine essence all right now um chrysostom makes a different argument you know there's a number of different arguments or ways you can interpret or or think about this uh, i like chrysostom's whole point uh whatever he does that the son does likewise uh so the son can only do what he sees the father doing uh whatever the son whatever the father does the son does likewise uh that's because our Lord is entirely obedient, okay? And our Lord only does, we hear in John 8, 29, what is pleasing to the Father. Uh, I only do what is pleasing to the Father. I always do what is pleasing to Him. All He does is what is pleasing to the Father. He's entirely obedient. There is no imperfection or disobedience or sin in our Lord. So total unanimity of will because they have one will um, so anyway that's a great argument um, now another important thing to see here is that uh, Augustine is going to spend so much time oh my gosh you think I'm being redundant or repetitive um, and beating a dead horse in this uh, in these classes on John 5 Oh my gosh, try to read the 70 pages of St. Augustine's homilies on chapter 5 that I plowed through. He goes, he spends so much time on these few verses here. 
I mean, he goes over it and over it and over it and over. He says the same thing over and over a zillion, million, billion times. Um, I had to hang in there, man. I was exhausted. I got a lot out of Augustine, um, but I had to pay for it. And there were 60 pages of uh, Aquinas on chapter 5 alone as well. And then another 30 pages of Chrysostom. So it was a lot. Um, all right, now... Um, the next point I want to make is um, our Lord's not acting simply by imitation. And that's that's the point that Augustine really hammers home. And Aquinas, you know, uh, takes up the same argument, you know, quoting Augustine. But uh, it's not just imitation, okay? It's a unity of act. That's the key. It's not like he's just doing, he sees the Father do something and then he does it. You know, two different acts. The Father does it. And then the son imitates it with a second separate act. Okay, two acts. One original, one by imitation. Two different acts. That's not how we need to understand this. Okay, there are not two acts. There's one act. Okay, the father is working in me. The father does his works in me. I and the father are one. Unity of act. Synergy. Got to keep that in mind. Um, not simply by imitation. So we got to utterly reject that notion. Uh, boy, does Augustine slam dunk that. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Our Lord's going to say in John 14, 10. Okay. Unified in substance, power, and will. Um, so there's a, you know, a tendency to want to see here in John's gospel, a certain like, master student apprentice student you know master student uh or master apprentice kind of paradigm um that's 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 a little sketchy that's a little given what we're saying um i would uh caution anybody from thinking that way using that paradigm to interpret our Lord's relationship with his father as kind of this Jewish theme or motif in the scriptures of the son and the father, you know, and the father teaches his son a trade like our Lord in the workshop. You know, you always see paintings of our Lord being taught the carpentry trade by Joseph. And so Joseph makes a cut in the wood or fashions something and pounds a nail in or something like that. And then he gives a board to uh, Jesus and he lets him pound nails or saw some boards or make something. Uh, so he's standing there watching, dutifully watching his father do some something. And then the father says, all right, now you try. And then he does it. Okay. Uh, careful with that whole father, son, or master apprentice paradigm. Uh, that can confuse us. That's an earthly model. An earthly model in time and space, a temporal thing. Uh, this we got to be. We're, we're we're strongly cautioned by Saint Augustine to reject that notion. But yet, that's exactly what C. H. Dodd, this famous biblical scholar, uh, he sees that as a whole entire motif or paradigm in John's Gospel, kind of like the Father, Son, Master, Apprentice. Uh, he actually calls it like a hidden parable. That you see in John's Gospel, man. After reading Augustine and Aquinas on this, uh, you'll see after I get done reading this next quote that uh, that's uh, a little tricky and uh, probably ill-advised uh, paradigm. All right, listen to Augustine on this point. He's taught he's refuting the Arian heretics. Okay, Arius was a monk who denied the divinity of Christ and said he was just a man. Okay. Um, so the Arians read, this is, this is why Augustine spent so much time on this, because he was dealing with this ding-dang Arian heresy at the time, okay? And uh, many, many bishops even were going after this, this uh, heresy uh, that denied the divinity of Christ. And even after the Jews just said that he's making himself equal with God, um, the, the Arians are trying to like, you know, they're spearfishing, they're, they're kind of like hijacking any little quote they can. They're kind of snatching and grabbing whatever they can 
that sounds problematic, like the Father is greater than I. Okay, when our Lord says that in John 14, you know, what, 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 uh, what does that mean? The Father is greater than I. Uh, you know, our Lord speaking in terms of his human nature in that instance. Um, but what's uh, tempting for the Arians is to take this uh, verse 19. And when Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the father doing, okay? They see that, and they're looking for anything they can lay their hands on to try to discount Jesus' divinity and to show that really what he intended is to show that he's just a man. And that's why he said this, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, okay? So that's called eisegesis, taking something out of context, grabbing something, and carrying away or reading into something. Okay, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. So the odd thing is that the Arians try to grab that 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 word of the son can do nothing of his own accord. They try to snatch that out of context and try to use that to disprove our Lord's divinity. Um, but when you read it in context, it's interesting, the fathers of the church do a little reversal on the Arians. And uh, they say, actually, when you read this properly, this actually doubles down on his divinity. This doubles down on his authority um, and his divine nature. So let's see uh, how that is um, by reading St. Augustine. Okay, the Arian heretics... They say that he who cannot do anything of himself but what he sees the Father doing is surely less, not equal. That he's somehow less than the Father because he says that. But Augustine continues, Thou hast set up two artisans, okay, remember? Master and apprentice. Think of the carpentry shop image here. Two artisans. Thou hast set up two artisans. So referring to the Arians and saying, that's how you're conceiving of this whole thing. That, uh, that Jesus is, was just a man and he was imitating the Father's works. That's all. He saw the Father do things and he made an imitation of it um, through his human nature alone. All right. Um, so that I set up two artisans, as it were, the Father and the Son, just like master and learner, like an artisan, like like as artisan fathers are wont to teach their sons their craft, like Joseph and Jesus. Suppose then the father as an artisan doing certain works, and the son as the learner, who cannot of himself do anything but what he seeth the father doing. The son keenly watches in a manner the father's hands, that as he seeth him fashioning aught, so he may himself in like manner fashion something sim similar by his own works. But thou, after holding with me that all things were made by the word, dost again with thy carnal wit and childish fancy imagine with thyself God making something and the word giving heed, so that when God has made, the world also may the, the word also may make the like. Now, what does God make without the word? For if he doeth aught, then were not all things made by the word? Thou hast given up the position which thou didst hold. If by the Son the Father doeth what he doeth, then the Father doeth not some and the Son others, but the works of the Father and of the Son are of the same works. Sorry, if that's, that's a really confusing jumble of, of some different quotations I tried to string together to, to, to make sense of Augustine's argument, which goes on and on and on. But I was trying to summarize it, and I wanted to get you to get a flavor of Augustine here, but I, I'll, I'll try to explain it a little bit. I mean, it's, it's as silly as saying, you know, the father's, you know, that image we can put in our mind of the father like the master craftsman or artisan standing there doing something, making something, 
and the son dutifully standing by watching him do it while he himself is doing nothing but just simply watching, attending to the father's work. And then after the father's done his work, then he turns to the son and says, now you do the same. And then the son fashions something. Okay, uh, that's not it at all. What we're talking about really is the son is, he is like the hands of the father. As I said before in the catechism, and we'll read some quotes, the son and the spirit are the hands of the father. So when the father's doing something, he's doing it with his hands. You can't separate these things out. It's not by imitation. Okay, it's simultaneous. Right? But here we're talking about something from all eternity. The two hands of the father. Let's think about that and, and let's look at a couple of uh, catechism paragraphs that say that very thing. So I think that's a helpful way to understand this and make this distinction. Paragraph 292 the Old Testament suggests and the New Covenant reveals the creative action of the Son and the Spirit. Inseparably one with that of the Father, the Son and the Spirit. Inseparably one with that of the Father. The Old Testament even suggests this because our Lord speaks, let there be and the Spirit hovered over the waters. Okay, His hands. And you see the Son and the Spirit throughout the Old Testament. Okay? The Old Testament suggests what we're saying here. What is later revealed in the New Covenant is that there is creative action undertaken by both the Son and the Spirit along with the Father. We think of the Father, properly speaking, it's appropriated to the Father. It's appropriate to think of the Father as the creator. Okay, but all three persons of the Blessed Trinity created, redeemed, and sanctified. Okay, even if we think of the Father as the creator, Son as the redeemer, Holy Spirit as the sanctifier, okay, you know, certain appropriateness to these titles. Okay, but the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all create, redeem, and sanctify. Okay, you cannot separate out their work inseparably one with that of the Father. This creative cooperation is clearly affirmed in the church's rule of faith. There exists but one God. He is the Father, God the Creator, the Author, the Giver of Order. He made all things by Himself, that is, by His Word and by His wisdom, by the Son and the Spirit, who, so to speak, are his hands. Creation is the common work of the Holy Trinity. Yeah, St. Irenaeus, a uh, great father and doctor of the church of the third century or second and third century, but he's the one that coined that expression of uh, referring to the Son and the Father as the two hands of the Father. Uh, that's what's cited in the catechism here. Um, but I think that's very helpful. And paragraph 704 says the same thing, but let's hear it. God fashioned man with his own hands, that is, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and impressed his own form on the flesh he had fashioned in such a way that even what was visible might bear the divine form. Okay, so God fashioned us with his own hands. Got down on his hands and knees. And with his hands, he fashioned us with the clay of the ground. Okay, so, um, all right. So, uh, I want to look at one scripture passage from uh, good old Isaiah here, 51.5. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones that refers to the two arms. In this case, my deliverance draws near speedily. My salvation has gone forth, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me. And the hands, the hands and the arms. The Lord has bared his holy arm. I, I, I love to think of, I mean, certainly, maybe it doesn't say hands. It, it says hands in some places, but also arms. The arm of the Father, the right hand of the Father. Um, so I think there's... Uh, 
uh, Irenaeus's analogy of the two hands is very biblical. Um, it's at least suggested in the Old Testament um, or this triune nature of Almighty God. All right, now Augustine says, uh, um, I don't know if I want to read this quote. I, I guess I will uh, listen to this in terms of showing and seeing because that gets confusing. You know, the father's showing something to the son and the son is seeing it. Okay, so this is really deep theology here that Augustine's doing with us. It's kind of tricky to follow. The father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. So the father's showing things to the son. Again, he's trying to disprove this dual craftsman, you know, image of the master and the apprentice. Some notion of imitation in the son. Um, and trying to discount the unity, the unified nature of the work. So uh, let's hear from St. Augustine, doctor of the church. With the father, to do and to show is the same thing. That hence we may understand that he doeth all things by the son seeing. Neither is that showing or seeing temporal. So Augustine saturated with this notion. I mean, he's really tried to elevate his understanding to the eternal order, to the eternal realm, and get his mind, rip his mind away from temporal earthly images of master and apprentice and things happening, you know, in time in consecutive fashion, chronological sequence. He's trying to get away from that, get that out of his brain and just think in eternal terms about this unique relationship between the father and the son. So when it says that the father is showing the son things, uh, what is that when the father, when the son is the emanation of the father's glory of his, his, his mind, his wisdom, his word. Okay. Can't think of this um, in human terms that hence we may understand that he doeth all things by the son seeing. Neither is, neither is that showing or seeing temporal. For as much as all times are made by the Son, they could not certainly be shown to him at any point of time to be made. But the Father's showing begets the Son's seeing, just in the same manner as the Father begets the Son. For the showing produces the seeing, not the seeing, the showing. For if we were able to look into this matter more purely and more perfectly, perhaps we should find that the Father is not one thing and his showing another, nor the Son one thing and his seeing another. Hope you didn't get too confused by all that. I think we're going to just let the thing cool. Let's take a little Sabbath rest from that whole reflection on the divine nature of the Son and how he works with the Father, is one with the Father in substance, power, might, will. All right, let's talk about life. Our Lord's going to talk about life and then he's going to talk about judgment. So let's begin with this uh, reflection on life. Uh, let's see, what does he say here? So picking up in verse 21, uh, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. And then he's going to talk about judgment immediately after that. Remember, those are the two works of God on the Sabbath. Uh, he brings life into the world and he judges it when it makes its departure from this world. Okay? Um, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Um, all right, I'm going to talk about the life part of this, okay? Uh, this movement from death 
to life. When our Lord says the hour is coming, truly, truly, in verse 25, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Um, this hour, the hour is coming and now is. We need to spend some time with that one. Uh, let's talk about this now is business. Okay, the hour is coming and now is when the dead are going to be raised. All right, basically is what he's saying. Um, those who are dead are going to be raised now and at a future time. Um, so let's talk about the now first. What does that even mean? Well, it means our soul. Our soul is already raised with Christ in a certain sense. When we're baptized in the state of grace, we are in Christ, okay, who is raised. We are sitting with him, St. Paul says, right now at this very moment, uh, in case you weren't aware, you're sitting with him at the right hand of God. Yeah, sitting with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh, right now. That's right now. That's in the present tense Paul's writing in. That uh, he has raised us up with him. All right? Past tense. He raised past us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places. That's going on right now. Not in some future time. Right now we're sitting with him in heavenly places. We are already here and now experiencing the resurrection. Um, we have already been raised from the dead in a certain sense, have been brought from death to life in the here and now. Uh, so what is it then to say that the hour is coming? Also, something in the future he alludes to uh, where there will be another resurrection, another raising from death to life. Well, there we have to see the body is going to have to die, go into the ground, and also be raised. But our soul is already experiencing the resurrection right now. That'll blow your mind to think about. Yeah, um, and this is uh, something that, you know, the Old Testament simply could not produce, could not bring this kind of life to our souls. Um, that our Lord is able to, by his paschal mystery of his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, he is able uh, to share this with us. So the hour is coming. It's kind of a historical reference to his paschal mystery. Um, when he is ultimately going to raise our bodies to share the life of his glorified body. And we shall see him like he is. For we will be like him. And we will see him as he is, John says. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All right. Now, the Old Testament, you know, just brought with it a curse, ultimately. Because no one's going to be able to keep the whole law. So Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 to 20, kind of makes that super abundantly clear. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. Um, basically, we're never going to be able to keep the whole law, okay? Um, we're doomed. Uh, so there's a certain, uh, you know, curse attached. We're all under a curse, okay? Um, you enter into a covenant curse in the old covenant, and we're all doomed. We're never going to be able to keep the whole law perfectly. Uh, the new covenant blessing, though, this blessing of the new covenant, uh, kind of, you know, displaces that covenant curse of the old covenant. Um, 
and brings with it new life that begins right here and now. So we got introduced to that new life in John chapter 3 when our Lord spoke with, some, with uh, Nicodemus. What did he say to him? Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born from above. Okay. Um, in other words, there is new life down here in the here and now. Okay. The hour is coming and is already here. Okay. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is. Okay. That now is, is this rebirth, this being born from above. Okay. It's baptism and the sacramental life. Okay. Um, it's being born again in the spirit, born from above, becoming children of God, rebirth regeneration okay here and now um we are experiencing this i already read you ephesians let's read a couple more how about romans chapter 6 verse 4 um we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death so that as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father we too might walk in newness of life we're experiencing the newness of life now We've already died with Christ and have already been raised uh, with him. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's skip to Colossians 2, 9 to 14. Um. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to the fullness of life in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. And you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So faith it ushers in this new life. The faith we receive in baptism, uh, faith brings with it, um, you know, um, a participation in the resurrection of Christ that we can actually say something so radical as this, St. Paul says, you were also raised with him. You were also raised with him. So we died and rose again in our baptism. When we plunge into that water, it's as though we're plunging into the tomb of Christ. And when we're brought out of the water, uh, we're brought out of the tomb. Uh, that's the idea there. So let's also read Colossians 3, 1 to 4. If then you have been raised with Christ. So he's, he begins with that presupposition. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Um, so we're already raised and sitting with him in heavenly places. Pretty cool, huh? Awesome. To contemplate this is also uh, taught by the catechism of the catholic church paragraph 1002 christ will raise us up on the last day yes okay the hour is coming okay our lord will raise us up in the future the hour is coming on the last day but it is also true that in a certain way we have already risen with Christ. For by virtue of the Holy Spirit, Christian life is already now on earth a participation in the death and resurrection of Christ. You're already risen from the dead. All right, so then what about this future resurrection? Um, well, let's... Before we get off that, I want to read a quote from Augustine. For we have risen in this resurrection 
if we have rightly believed and we ourselves who have already risen are looking for another resurrection in the end, moreover, both now, both now we are risen to eternal, both now are we, both now are we risen to eternal life if we perseveringly continue in the same faith and then too we shall rise to eternal life when we shall be made equal with the angels. So there's a, a twofold resurrection, a twofold participation in the resurrection that our Lord is alluding to when he says the hour is coming and now is. We're already, it's an already and, and not yet. Already and not yet. All right, so we're already participating in it, but yes, our bodies must die and then be raised again. So there is a future resurrection, participation in the resurrection. Now, so let's talk about that then part, the body, okay? So we are participating now in our soul, but one day our body will also experience the power of the resurrection. Even if right now we got to take Advil twice a day and sell bricks and whatever else, all right? Um, let's hear about that resurrection of the body a little bit by looking some more at St. Paul here, Romans 8, 11. Um, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. That's what our Lord means when he says the hour is coming. A future participation in the resurrection. That will be our bodies, our mortal flesh, St. Paul says. Um, the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit who dwells in you. Wow. All right. Uh, John 5, 28 and 29. I mean... We can skip ahead, uh, just read a couple verses down. And uh, in this very self-same chapter, uh, he talks about this very thing. So let's hear about it. And uh, reading on, um, I'll start back up in 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. All right. Um, so here, clearly, when he says, those who are in the tombs, all who are in the tombs, now he's talking about bodily death. Our mortal bodies are still going to have to die. Even though we are enjoying uh, a participation in the resurrection now, our bodies still must die one day. But then our bodies will also share in this resurrection. So I think this is all... I'm probably beating a dead horse, so let me see. Um, anything else I want to say about that? Um, well, let's just look at uh, Hymenius and Philetus in 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. This is just worth noticing because there's two guys in the early church that actually denied the resurrection of the body. So that uh, hour is coming, a future participation of our bodies um, is something that Paul explicitly taught us there in Romans 8, 11, okay, and elsewhere, uh, the body is going to rise, all right? The mortal flesh, like our Lord said in the end of John's gospel, he's going to be like, look, you know, look at my hands, look at, look at my feet. You see me standing here eating a piece of fish? It's like, you know, look, uh, flesh and blood doesn't do this type of stuff. Um, uh, sorry, the end of Luke's gospel, he says, handle me and see. <laughs> it 
See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. Okay? So, I mean, anybody that tries to deny the physical resurrection of the body of this stuff, okay? If you try to deny that, you're going to have a hard time getting out of things like at the end of Luke's Gospel or Romans 8, 11. I mean, there's some clear indications that it's the flesh, the body that is also going to be participating in the power of the resurrection. All right, but that's what these two knuckleheads, um, Philetus and Hymenius, uh, tried to argue here. So let's hear what they have have to say here. This is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 to 19. Avoid such godless chatter, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will eat its way like gangrene. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth by holding that the resurrection is past already. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Um, anyway, they're saying that the resurrection is something that already happened in the past. And now we're all, you know, basically... Uh, raised from the dead in a certain sense that yeah even when we slough off this mortal coil you know and and depart we're going to just be like angels in heaven we're not going to be angels but we will be like angels okay um but that's not to say we're the same as angels um but uh the point is that uh, this was difficult for the greek Somebody trained in Greek thinking, that's exactly what they thought. Um, that our true self, you know, that the soul is the is imprisoned in the body and is just kind of trying to get free of it, of the physical world, um, to enter the immaterial spiritual world. Uh, but that's simply not Christian. And that's what you hear Paul uh, condemning here in Hymenius and Philetus, this idea of theirs uh, that rejects the resurrection, a future resurrection of the body, uh, is 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 a gangrene or cancer in the in the body of Christ. That idea, that notion, is not Christian at all. All right, uh, what else can we say here? Let's talk about the authority to judge. Now that our Lord claims to have the authority to judge. Because clearly he does have that authority. As the scriptures testify, look at Acts 10, 42. Uh, St. Peter says that uh, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. So our Lord is the judge. St. Paul's going to say the same thing to the men in the Areopagus in Athens. He's going to say, look, the times of ignorance God overlooked. Now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. Okay, so our Lord Peter and Paul and the Acts of the Apostles both testify in their preaching has been appointed uh, to judge the living and the dead. It's, it's a task assigned to him by the Father. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive good or evil according to what he has done in the body. Okay, We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So when our Lord says here in John's Gospel, um, Father has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Okay. The father judges no one, but has given all judgment, given all judgment to the son. He's given all judgment to the son and given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. So why does it say here that the father judges no one in verse 22? The Father judges no one. It doesn't make a lot of sense when you read 
chapter 8, verse 16 of John's gospel, it seems pretty explicit here that, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone that judge, but I and he who sent me. Um, man, the work that we've done up to this point, unifying the Son and the Father, helps clear this up. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And whatever the Son does, therefore, the Father also does. So if our Lord is judging, how can he judge when he is of a unified substance, will, and power as the Father? The Son can't do anything without the Father. The Father can't do anything without the Son. So of course the Father is judging. But he has given, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. What does that really mean? Here we got to switch back and think about our Lord's human nature. Got to do a lot of switching around. You got to have a, you got to be really quick, you know, to understand where John's coming from. He switches from the divine to the human, to the divine, to the human. So now we have to conceive of our Lord's human nature has been made visible to us. And that's something, a crucial ingredient to the final judgment that we see our judge. God the Father cannot be seen. He is invisible by nature. Okay. Um, and he's appointed this judgment to the Son, our Lord says, because he is the Son of Man, okay? Because, like in Matthew 25, in the separation of the sheep and the goats, we are to see with our eyes our judge in his human nature. That is why um, the Father has appointed him to judge. Because it's apparently it's important that we see our judge, okay? But at <laughs> but on the on the divine on the level of divine nature once again when our lord judges okay the father also judges All right um augustine says for this is said because none will appear to man in the judgment but the son the father will be hidden the son will be manifest all right um so what does this mean in verse 24 here that uh, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. We don't come into judgment. We don't come into judgment. We already talked about the life part. OK, uh, you know, we've already entered into life. We we've already been raised with him. We already have eternal life uh, dwelling within us like a fountain of living water, as he told the Samaritan woman at the well. Ask me for a drink and I'll give you living water. Um, you know, water that's going to rise up. We'll hear in chapter 7, you know, if anyone drinks this water, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. We have this living water bubbling up within us a fountain an upward surging fountain of spiritual life of the power of the resurrection in us right now we're seated in heavenly places uh, but what does this mean in verse 24 about how we're not going to come into judgment he does not come into judgment a person who's living this spiritual life here and now our lord says does not come into judgment I thought we were all, I thought we just heard in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.10 that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. What the heck? Before we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So how do you, uh, it seems like there's a contradiction in the scriptures. So our Lord saying anybody who's living this spiritual life here and now does not come into judgment. But then Paul tells us, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. How do we reconcile these two texts which seem to be completely opposed to one another? One says we're not going to be judged. One says we're going to be judged, all of us. Uh, the fathers of the church are really good at making the proper distinction here. Um, let's hear from Augustine. Sometimes judgment means punishment. 
and sometimes it means discrimination. What is shall not come into judgment is really shall not come into condemnation. So there's a judgment of discrimination, separation, or examination, okay? We're all going to experience that. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.10 makes sense from the, con, from the in the sense of discrimination. We're all going to stand before the Son of Man and um, for the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to see him in his human nature visible to us as the Father has appointed him to be our judge. And he will make these distinctions distinguish okay so we're all going to experience that judgment augustine says of discrimination separation or examination okay but then there's another sense in which the word judgment is used that is the sense of condemnation so that's what he's referring to here in verse uh, 29 um down below the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Okay, so here in this case, in verse 29 of, of John chapter 5, we're talking about the resurrect, the judgment of condemnation. Judgment of condemnation. So up in verse 24, he says... He does not come into judgment. Anybody who's leading this spiritual life, who's been born from above, who has this fountain of living water, this life of the resurrection in their soul here and now, will not come into a judgment of condemnation. They will enter into this resurrection of life. But those who've done evil, they will in fact enter into this resurrection of judgment in the sense of condemnation. But we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. And there will be this judgment, a judgment of discrimination of the sheep and the goats, separation or examination of the sheep. All right. Uh, yeah, we can look at the catechism here. How are we doing on time? All right, let's look at the catechism. And paragraph 1470s we're looking at here. Talking about the effects of the sacrament of reconciliation. Listen to this. In this sacrament, the sinner placing himself before the merciful judgment of God anticipates in a certain way the judgment to which he will be subjected at the end of his earthly life. For it is now in this life that we are offered the choice between life and death. And it is only by the road of conversion that we can enter the kingdom from which one is excluded by grave sin. In converting to Christ through penance and faith, the sinner passes from death to life and does not come into judgment. And guess what it quotes? John 5, 24. John 5, 24. So the life of penance and faith anticipates this this judgment um and we're doing an end run you know we're anticipating uh our judgment the judgment of discrimination and we're getting right with god making friends with our accuser on the way so to speak uh and we're therefore we will be exempted if we live a true life of penance and faith in this life we will avoid the judgment of condemnation altogether He does not come into judgment. And instead will receive the resurrection of life. And those who refuse this path of penance and faith, they will enter into the resurrection of judgment. All right, I have made that super abundantly clear, I hope. Um, got like five minutes left. I don't know. Let's do a couple quick things here. When he says greater works than these, greater works than these I will do, what is he really referring to? Well, we're gonna we're kind of alluding to chapter eleven and the raising of Lazarus from the dead here. So that's really what we see when our Lord says that. 
For the Father loves the Son, up in verse 26. I can't read verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life, and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. So greater works than these, so that you may marvel, will be shown unto you. What is that really a reference to? The raising of Lazarus coming down range in chapter 11, all right? Now, um, the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Yeah, the voice of God is a powerful thing to reflect upon. Um, you know, we can look back at Daniel. Let's go back, honestly, and look at Psalm 29 and just reflect with me. I mean, seven times it says here uh, about the voice of the Lord. These, these descriptions of the voice of the Lord in Psalm 29 are so powerful to think about. The voice of the Lord. When you consider Psalm 29 in the context of John chapter 5 here, when our Lord says, you know, the hour is coming. The hour is coming. What the heck? The hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. The hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Let's think about the majesty of that voice by reading Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of, of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. In his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Oh my goodness, the voice of the Lord. The hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Gosh, like many trumpets, like many waters. When John hears his voice at the beginning of Revelation, what does he say? So he says in verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10 of the book of Revelation, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And in the midst of the, he sees the lampstands and, and one like a son of man standing in the midst of the lampstands. And he falls at his feet as though dead. So the risen Lord appears to him. But his voice is like a trumpet blast I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet so anyway uh, the voice of the Lord I think we'll read uh, we're almost done here catechism paragraph 1000 I'm talking about resurrection here um, the Eucharist is interesting to think about in the context of everything we've been saying. We're already participating in the resurrection, but not yet. Um, yet our participation in the Eucharist all, already gives us a foretaste of Christ's transfiguration of our bodies. Just as bread that comes from the earth after God's blessing has been invoked upon it, 
is no longer ordinary bread, but Eucharist, formed of two things, the one earthly and the other heavenly, so too our bodies, which partake of the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, but possess the hope of resurrection. I tell you, man, I hold up the Eucharistic species for a long time in the Mass. If you come to Mass, any of my Masses, you'll see I like to do that because I'm standing there holding something from heaven. Something otherworldly. I'm holding up for everyone to look at. I mean, just remember uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind or whatever, you know, that movie when that spaceship came down. They were all mesmerized and it was an amazing thing. Uh, you know, we see with our naked eyes the accidents of bread and wine. But with the eyes of faith, what we should see is something entirely otherworldly. Um, can't see it unless you've been born again, born from above. We still have one more. Actually, one more class we're going to have to do on, uh, on John chapter 5, okay? So until then, God bless you.